Hey, welcome to the Total Bitcoin podcast show. My name is Kevan Davani. Really looking forward to my next panel discussion uh, again with Ben Kaufman and Stephanie von Jan. Ben Kaufman recently uh, published his really amazing article. It's called Bitcoin and Business Cycle. Uh, before you know, we talk about because I want to talk about the practical solutions. What do we need? You know, where are we where do we go from here? What is the solution effectively at the root of the problem? But you know, uh, before that, we need to you know understand uh, what is you know um, what is being done by uh, increasing the money supply. Um, how are business cycles uh, created? Uh, how are uh, boom and bust cycles um, over and over repeatedly, uh, you know, perpetrated and and caused? Uh, so we need to talk about printing, you know, about uh, a quantitative easing, bank credit expansion, liquidity in injection, quantitative easing, public deficit spending. Uh, or helicopter money, you know. So you know, regardless of any differences uh, in the academic world, you know, with the Keynesianism, modern monetary, modern monetary theories, it all you know misses the point. So this is why we need to talk about Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the solution with its absolute scarcity, with its immutability, with its total decentralization, with its uh, with all the other you know uh, fundamental Im fundamental important monetary properties. It has because it relies on you know do not trust verify mathematics cryptography totally decentralized immutable so we need to find practical solutions and we need to educate this is about education this is about finding effective solutions to our very uh, you know horrendous symptoms that we're encountering as a society civilization with um, Economies melting down, people losing their jobs, and uh, yeah, dev and and our money dev being devalued constantly, and this is why Bitcoin. Bitcoin is the solution because uh, it creates the free market that we have always uh, dreamt of. It, it it creates equal opportunities, and this is why it's such a you know uh, unimaginable. Uh, not only economical evolution, but on every level you can think of, socially, scientifically, technologically, financially. Um, and, you know, it creates prosperity and joy, and that's what we want. At the end of the day, we need to educate more and more people, starting with the merchants, small businesses, uh, shop owners, you know, workers, employees, all the people. We need to, we need to urgently educate more and more people. All right, without further ado, this is my talk with Stephanie von Jan and Ben Kaufman with his article, Bitcoin and Business Cycles. All right, here we go. Welcome to the Total Bitcoin Podcast Show. My name is Kevan Davani, and my very special guests again are Stephanie von Jan and Ben Kaufman. Thanks so much for coming. Welcome. Thank <laughs> Thanks for inviting me again. All right, Ben, you published a really awesome article. Uh, it went pretty viral. Even, um, who was that? I oh, just tweeted. I think, it was, yeah, Corey Clipson from Swan, uh, Bit uh, Swan Bitcoin or Give Bitcoin was also really, really um, enthusiastic and really um, excited about your article. So, so Ben, um, I want to ask you, before we go into you know the deeper questions, especially the deeper questions of Stephanie, um, what I want to do is like, um, do you want to break down the article like because this is you know I wanna I wanna um, make this really comprehensively understandable for the average person out there. What do you what is what is can you define or explain what is um, the business cycle or the the boom and bust cycles. Uh. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. So the the problem of the boom and bust cycle is uh, basically a very old um, problem of of basically almost every capitalist society, um, which is basically the the production structure is characteristically having uh, periods of a large economic growth very fast uh, what is called the economic boom um, where everything is going up everything is going very well 
uh, until uh, at some point the trend reverses and there begins a, a period of bust. Basically, we're like a bubble which pops, um, the boom turns into a bust, um, businesses starting to collapse, and entrepreneurial efforts are turning unprofitable uh, all across the economy. Uh, basically, it's, it's a collapse of a lot of entrepreneurial activity, uh, all, basically across all sectors of the economy. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what are the causes? Yeah, so the traditional causes are very, like, very, they're very, uh, there are a lot of uh, different explanations, like, which are more traditional, but uh, in the article, I, I go with the Austrian, which I believe to be the only correct one. So the explanation given by the Austrian economists, um, first of all, I think it was Ludwig von Mises which started it. Um, so he explained the, the cycle as a result um, of, uh, of uh, a result, sorry, he explained the cycle as a result of inflation and uh, what he called credit expansion. So when states or banks, or more correctly both, uh, expand credit, basically they create money out of thin air or credit out of thin air. Um, the, sorry, the, prices for, for goods and services start, um, are starting to rise. Um, but basically due to the Cantillon effect, they don't rise the same everywhere. They start rising uh, first of all in the production goods uh, and only later in the, in the rest of the economy. Basically this creates um, a distortion of, of prices uh, in the economy. Uh, it lures entrepreneurs into activities which are not really profitable. Um, that's that's the big uh, idea. Mm -hmm. And what is it based on? So it's it's based on Keynesianism. Uh, is it uh, the, the the old school or the dogma of Keynesianism? Can we summarize that with? Um, so this is, uh, this is absolutely not what Keynesians explain. So if I remember correctly, uh, Keynesians explain that, um, or under consumption, I don't know if that's like still the, the narrative because Keynesianism is basically switched to neo and post Keynesianism. Um, but I think the original, at least the original explanation of them was some uh, under consumption that people just stop consuming enough products and because they stop consuming people don't buy and the entrepreneurs just fail uh, and the problem is that this doesn't explain why all the entrepreneurs suddenly became so so basically <laughs> why they became so stupid as to think that people would buy a lot more than they actually wanted to buy um in Basically, it doesn't explain why there, why there is a mass failure of all entrepreneurs or a large, a very large part of the entrepreneurs. So how I ex um, understood this, that you had an interest rate that was too low and therefore they could get um, money that was actually too cheap. Um, it was cheaper than what the market would have required. Then they created something with this money that only justified or only like served these like low rates. But if there was like a higher rate, they couldn't like surf this. And this is actually how capital was destroyed. So I really kind of like this argument. Um, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on this? Mm -hmm. Yes. So when banks, governments start to expand credit, uh, whatever it is, uh, quantitative easing or uh, fractional reserve banking in some forms or all forms, it's still debated, but uh, for sometimes also fractional reserve banking. Um, basically, this starts uh, lowering the interest rate. There's more money available to borrow, um, basically without the bank needing to, uh, to keep less money. There's just more money, uh, more nominal money, more correctly, in circulation. Um, mm -hmm. The banks can start lending more to entrepreneurs, so they can start lending more cheaply. Uh, interest rates are getting lower, the entrepreneurs, uh, entrepreneurial activities 
are becoming more profitable than they were before because the interest rate is lower than before. So they start taking more loans, they start taking um, larger projects uh, than they would have taken otherwise. But the problem is that besides the, the more nominal uh, money printed, money created, there is no actual, there's no more uh, capital goods which are actually available to use in the market. Uh, there's not enough, uh, there's not, there's no more uh, factories, there, there are no more raw materials than there were previously. The only thing that changes that is the uh, nominal amount of money. <clears throat> and the problem with that is, sorry, and the problem with that is that, um, is that since there's, there wasn't anything else that changed, uh, only, the, only the interest rate changed, uh, there's, nothing, there's no possibility of actually expanding the, uh, the production. Uh, there's no possibility of taking on new production activities. Um, so if entrepreneurs start to do that, and they start to do that because credit is cheaper, uh, they will find out that they will not have enough money eventually to complete all the projects that they've started. This creates basically a bubble, a boom, uh, which is uh, then uh, which is then becomes sorry, which then makes a bust inevitable uh, because the projects are just unsustainable. They are basically building on resources which do not exist in order to, to finish them. Does that uh, make sense? Yeah, totally, totally. So, um, how how can you, or maybe you can explain how um, it is prevented to like make this uh, boom go bust. So we see that there's like more and more money just injected, and maybe you can explain a little bit, uh, what this hap makes mm -hmm. the whole economy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so normally if, if we talk about, like, let's take the simpler example of a one-time uh, credit injection, a uh, one-time credit expansion in the economy. So what will happen is that uh, interest rates become lower, entrepreneurs start taking on new loans and start expanding production, uh, taking on new initiatives. Um, this means that they will start borrowing more funds. Uh, and with the funds that they borrow, they, they will buy more capital goods uh, than they were, uh, they were planning to buy before the, the credit expansion. This means that uh, because there is no new supply of capital goods, but there is new demand, the, um, the prices of the capital goods will start rising accordingly um, to price in the, the new demand. And so the prices of the capital of the capital goods will start uh, to rise, and entrepreneurs will need to to take new loans in order to actually finish the production they've started. Uh, they've started the production with a certain level of uh, capital goods prices, and now the capital goods are at another uh, price level. So they will need more loans in order to to finish production. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, when they finish the uh, when they start taking on new loans, the interest rate will rise back up to, to its real levels. And then it will become clear that the projects are not truly profitable. Uh, it will become clear that there is not enough capital to, to finish all projects, that the projects that were started were actually a waste of resources. Uh, and they will have to be liquidated and this will turn, the boom will turn into a bust um, pretty quickly. However, the governments uh, and banks don't really let it, this happen, um, at least not anymore, or especially not anymore. They try to, uh, to inject uh, more and more credit and prevent the, um, sorry, and prevent the investments from being liquidated. Um, so this, this, they can, by expanding credit further, they can uh, sustain the, uh, uh, they can sustain the, what Ms. is called malinvestment. So mm -hmm. all the investments which are not truly sustainable that were taken during the boom, they can sustain them for, for a while by keeping uh, interest rate artificially lower and injecting more and more money. Um, but they can't do this forever. Eventually the, the resources are just not existing. Uh, the resources that uh, the, the entrepreneurs are building upon are, not, are just not there. And uh, no, no printing of money can change that. No uh, credit creation can change that. 
So eventually, um, the, it, well, there can be multiple things. There can be like a, an external event, like right now with, with the coronavirus, which can trigger, you know, which it makes, the, basically it makes the economy a lot more fragile. So even a slight uh, problem like like the virus, like if you or or like any natural disaster or stuff like that, uh, will uh, be able to cause such collapse. Um, but besides that, even if they continue it uh, further and further, um, what could happen next is that either uh, hyperinflation will ensue when the money just continues to sort of depreciate in value. Um, but this is this is quite unlikely, but it is possible, at least quite unlikely in the modern societies in the developed countries. Um, but what also could happen is that after, basically after interest rates are pushed lower and lower, so credit must be ex uh, expanded and interest rates lowered in, at accelerating pace uh, to keep up with the, with the lack of actual resources, to cover up on the lack of actual resources. And eventually they will have to be lowered, lowered to zero and eventually lower than zero. As we see now, uh, a lot of governments try to push interest rates below zero, which is just absurd. Mm -hmm. um, so eventually we'll, when that happens across all the, all the economy, no investing can take place anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, this is when things get really bad, where the economy will just come to a standstill. Yeah. But I think we're still far from that, but we're kind of on the way there mm -hmm. right now. So I actually have a follow-up question exactly on that. Do you know the concept of zombie companies that Markus Krall laid out? Um, no. No, okay. But it's actually what you are saying, that you have these companies that are working with uh, that are actually malinvestments that are destroying capital and that would not survive in a free market. Um, he calls them zombie companies and they can only survive. Oh, zombie? Yes, zombie, zombie companies. Zombie yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah and exactly. And they only survive because they can get this cheap uh, credit and so they can, can, can continue with their uh, business. And now um, we see that they might not even like uh, pay back minimal credit um, although everything is lowered down so much and so this could um, come to an effect where more and more zombie companies go bust and then we have uh, um, big uh, insolvencies and then uh, Markus Kral was actually uh, arguing that we would see um, bank bailouts and uh, a collapse of many banks at once and then he also sees hyperinflation and here I was wondering why don't you see hyperinflation why don't you see this whole scenario coming well right now uh, it depends where so i guess in, in smaller countries or less developed countries it, it can happen right now but i think with the more developed countries, uh, there is also a, a very, especially in the U.S., there is a strong deflationary pressure from from the credit, which basically disappears during uh, a, dep uh, a depression. So during an economic collapse, during the bust, uh, credit, bank credit, or credit uh, in other forms, is is basically turning to, uh, turning to nothing. It's, people start to default on their loans and the credit disappears. Basically, the money disappears from the economy, which uh, put the deflationary pr um, pressure uh, on, on the entire economy. Mm -hmm. um, this is then central banks trying to counter this deflationary um, prop uh, propensity kind of, of, of this bust period with, with more money printing. And it is the, it, we can't really know if they print more money uh, than actually uh, disappeared due to default or they uh, printed less or you know uh, you can't exactly know that or and you certainly don't know how um, how the money that they injected will actually affect the economy um, but I'm not I mean they've quite successfully managed to, to prevent hyperinflation so far. 
and I think we're still not at like at the last point. At um, I think they do have. Uh, I think we will see much uh, more uh, popular popularity of uh, negative interest rates and stuff like that before we will see uh, actual hyperinflation. Okay, let me ask you a follow-up on um, my side. Is it because mm -hmm. also, is it is the reason we don't see yet, you know, a, um, a tangible uh, inflation, not to speak of hyperinflation, but because, um, you know, all the trades, the credits usually are, are run uh, on, on the dollar because it's a dominant international reserve currency. Remember there was this article on Zero Hedge about the Euro dollar. So everything is on because, you know, it's a dominant currency. Uh, uh, mm -hmm. Is that the reason why it, it could still yeah, sort of be a, a gradual a process? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I think, I think it's a very large part of it. I think it's a good article. Yeah, it's a large part of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. And the other question is really important, I think, to understand is that the stock market is detached from reality from because there's no productivity right there's no production behind the rise the exponential insane rise of the stock market so can you maybe elaborate mm -hmm. like in context of, of the article yeah i think the like the um it was a guy i think it was eric i forgot his last name uh from uh, protocol podcast which uh, first published uh, or, uh, on his page i saw that like a picture of uh, the stock best week of the stock market in a hundred years and below like the highest unemployment uh, like in a hundred years something like that like something ex just extremely absurd uh, i think i do think the market is the stock market is quite detached from reality um basically when you're guaranteed they're quite investors are quite guaranteed that if the big company, if they invest in the big companies, which are considered um, uh, too big to fail, they will get bailed out. They will get uh, money back. Uh, it's not explicit most of the time, but it is very strong implicit uh, promise. So you get to a point where you have basically only an upside of going up and almost no upside, uh, no downside uh, if the company doesn't do well. So you, it just it just becomes a no-brainer trade. Uh, you, um, the company start to do to do well, you get profits. The company fails, the government gives you money instead. Um, so I do think this is just a, a single aspect where the government is manipulating the stock market. Um, but there are more like aspects. But yes, this is. Currently, this is a, a, a very important problem, I think, uh, with, because with, the stock market trillions. is very I mean, important to I think follow. That, yeah, that's the point. I mean, you mm -hmm. know, it, it, the trillions, right, printed or somehow pumped into the mm -hmm. into the stock market. This is something a point that people really need to realize. But how long can you do? You think can you can this go on? I mean, how how far can you <laughs> blow up this bubble? You know, I mean, um, while you know the this. Mm -hmm. The company, whatever yeah. the CEOs, the corporations, this uh, you know, they, they are actually profiting, while ev while the whole economy is crashing. How is this possible? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I I'm still so personally, I'm still surprised that it survived the the 2008 uh, collapse. Uh, so I don't think I'm the guy to ask how how much how long it will take to collapse. So I only know that it it will eventually inevitably collapse, but it it's really hard it's really hard to to tell how how exactly it will uh, sorry when exactly it will collapse. Um, if I have to guess, it's a matter of like a decade or two, but it's really hard to tell. But mm -hmm. the only thing I can say for sure is that this is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, a lot of Bitcoiners uh, and many and sorry, not many, very few actually, financial analysis, but still few. We're talking about it uh, before the corona that uh, there will be a, a eventually a financial uh, collapse, that the economy will uh, will start to, will, will go bust, and which we start to see uh, right now, mm -hmm. actually. 
So a lot of people will try to blame it on the corona exclusively, but this this is just not true. And this is not just the corona fault. Yeah, it's like decades of um, malinvestments investments and decades of like artificially changing interest rates. And uh, yeah, the whole financial system is actually the root problem. And that's why we need a change. That's why we mm -hmm. need Bitcoin. <laughs> right. But maybe before we go to Bitcoin, there's one thing that I would like to point out. I just checked um, that we had more than two trillion US dollar were printed by the Federal Reserve just in the last few days, actually, or weeks. And we had um, an increase by um, how much? One, one trillion um after the last financial crisis so we had already a lot of printing now it's like more than double and we see how much they continue with that and if they like go completely crazy and we mean we can know they can print infinitely then there must be a greater inflation because this money eventually trickles down to the economy yeah eventually yes <laughs> eventually yeah but with what value, with what, I mean, that's a cantillion. You want to explain a little bit the cantillion effect? Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Um, so the cantillion effect says that money doesn't affect, the new money doesn't affect the entire economy at the same time. Uh, that money in more uh, economic terms, I think that it was that money is not uh, neutral. Uh, it's not that money uh, has the same value all across the economy. Um, that, that is that, for example, if we uh, have $100 in the economy and we print uh, 100 more, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that prices will start going, will, will double uh, immediately. Uh, what will happen is that it depends on where the money is getting in from. If we have $100 uh, in the economy and then add $100 more, uh, from uh, by giving it to a certain bank or a certain person, then it will affect the economy differently because it will start by uh, affecting prices of the, the goods and services which this person buys and sells. Uh, it will start uh, the effect of the of the new money. Uh, the effect on prices will start from that person and will spread out from him according um, um, to to the rest of the economy. First to those who, which uh, he interacts with, and then those that the, uh, the second, you know, the second uh, wave interacts with, and so on and so forth. Uh, and the money will start losing its value, uh, basically, more and more uh, as it goes on in the economy, as prices are adjusting more and more uh, across the economy. So this is eventually what happens is is a redistribution of, of purchasing power where the first recipients get more uh, purchasing power and the, the last recipients get, the, get their purchasing power actually diluted. Um, so eventually what, what that means is that what the Cantillon effect can to, comes to, to explain is that uh, printing money is, is a wealth transfer uh, from, from the first recipients, uh, from the, sorry, from the last recipients to the first recipients. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, okay. Um, do you have any questions, Stefan, before we go to the Bitcoin based economy? No, that's fine. <laughs> okay. All right. So let's focus now on the solution. Then what is, um, what would an economy of, a, you know, uh, of an uh, economy of sanity, of rationality, of um, ethical principles, based on it based on bitcoin look like what would change what what would be different mm -hmm. um so first of all you will not have uh, the what is called the lender of last resort uh but, um, which is currently the federal reserve uh, in in our example um so this this creates just a, a lot of uh, moral hazard and a lot of economic problems. So with Bitcoin, of course, you don't have such such an institution uh, like with gold. Uh, they both don't have any option of lender of last resort of uh, a 
an institution which can uh, guarantee a bailout for banks or can expand credit and uh, money by itself or, or set interest rates that just can't, can't happen with Bitcoin. Um, what that means is that prices will be reflective of the actual economic conditions. They will uh, be set by the market, uh, which of course is the only mechanism to set prices correctly. Um, so this is the, like the first uh, aspect of Bitcoin. It will allow for correct uh, pricing of, of, first of all, of interest rates and uh, from that to, to everything. Hmm. And um, as you say in your besides, article, it would it would it would really allow for the first time a sustainable economic growth, right? It would dramatically mm -hmm. change everything, right? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I believe that this um, this will allow for more sustainable economic growth, or truly sustainable economic growth, because uh, without the uh, credit expansion, um, the malinvestments will not start in the first place. So if the, the interest rate is not manipulated anymore, entrepreneurs will not uh, be lured into uh, investments which they cannot finish. And the actual economic growth which takes place will actually be sustainable, uh, unlike today. Um, besides that, uh, the, I think the important uh, uh, difference from between Bitcoin and gold because uh, gold has doesn't have a finite supply, but they both you know the, you can print gold. Uh, they both uh, are independent from from political pressures. So I think the but the actual difference uh, between them is that Bitcoin is is owned by by its users. Uh, Bitcoin can operate with. Uh, without any uh, intermediaries uh, in the process. So gold can do that physically, but uh, we don't live in a, in a physical world anymore. Uh, we just, we, we left it pretty long ago already. Uh, we live in, in a world, in an interconnected society of, you know, uh, of all over the world. Uh, we can't. We don't transact anymore truly uh, face to face, and even when we do, we don't do this. So with uh, we, people will not do this, and haven't done that for centuries with, uh, with with coins. They did it for centuries already with banknotes, uh, and now credit cards, etc. So. Uh, gold always needs uh, needs uh, trust in some third party, in some middleman, in some uh, bank. Basically, uh, you can't have the, the users actually holding the money or controlling it by themselves. And this is the one of the important differences between gold and Bitcoin. Bitcoin allows the, the users to control it. It doesn't require middlemen, which can then. Uh, uh, manipulate the the supply basically by uh, by uh, fractional reserve in in many uh, yeah in many uh, uh, ways let's let's put it that way. Um, you also mentioned in your article that uh, with Bitcoin you can better differentiate between your savings and what you really invest, and when now you put mm -hmm. your money at the bank, actually everything is like bundled at once, and you don't even get mm -hmm. an interest for, for your uh, savings. So maybe you can elaborate a little bit on that. Mm -hmm. Yes, so right now you just have to, to put everything in the bank in order to, to use most of the, for most of the use cases. So you can still use uh, cash, but this even this is fading away right now with, you know, with no cash, uh, cashless societies. Um, but basically right now you have to have all your money in the bank and the bank can start lending it, you know, with personal reserve banking. Uh, it can start lending it to other people, uh, even though you still need it, you still use that money. Um, so the, with Bitcoin, you don't need to give the bank any money which you plan to, to actually use. You can give it only the money which you plan to save and, and want to, to get returns on. So you don't need, if you want money uh, money available to you every time, you just keep it with yourself, Bitcoin. 
but if you uh, this is the money is actually for savings and you uh, you want to to actually lend it and make it productive then you can give it to to banks um, this will create a, a distinction between money uh, money for savings and actual and just cash balances which people keep for expenses mm -hmm. and the money which is not circulating the money which is for saving Mm -hmm. uh, can actually be productively invested uh, back into the economy, while the well, without uh, the uh, the extra credit that, uh, expansion they can create with uh, the, the money which is uh, still circulating in the economy. So the money for expenses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. So I really see a split of banks becoming then custody providers only and where you pay them for their service of holding your um, assets in custody. And I hope most uh, hold their Bitcoin in self custody, at least a portion, because otherwise we go into the same problem of centralization. So this may be mm -hmm. a side note. And then we have these investment vehicles and where you can invest your Bitcoin and they uh, transparently tell you on what they invest which you also don't have right now with the banks you don't know what they invest you don't know the risks and there you also have much more of a competition between these, these different investment vehicles mm -hmm. yeah right now you yeah mm -hmm. important to have a sustainable economy where you have like transparency and competition and investments actually yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah i agree Right now, you you don't even like the problem with the banks now is that you really don't have risks because even though the, the investments can can crash, the government is basically uh, uh, committing to, to provide the bank with money in case it doesn't have enough, you know. So there's not you, basically there's no uh, uh, there's no risk right now with with the fractional reserve banking as it is almost entirely insured by by the government mm. yeah and i was actually digging deeper into like government bonds and what they actually are i mean it's actually when they uh, the government gets uh, money as a through the government bond they're actually promising the future tax payments to the, the federal reserve or to the central banks or to the banks actually who gave them the money so actually mm -hmm. they are um like getting the money and having the people the future generations right oh uh, yeah the well also well the generations now that just bring the future cash inflow through mm -hmm. taxes in and this is what they hold in place for getting getting the government bonds so everything is kind of like rolled down to the average person uh, and this is like not zero risk because they're kind of piling it so much more up that it's just unrealistic that it can be paid back mm -hmm. so it's yes yes <laughs> but it's not that it's so. zero risk it's zero risk only nominally but not actually yeah. in, in mm -hmm. exactly. power. yeah So in your conclusion, in the article, Ben, uh, you eloquently, very beautifully, you know, you summarize the unique properties of Bitcoin. Uh, I'm going to quote here, being digital, peer-to-peer, -peer, unstoppable, hard money, have the potential to make a real transformation in the economy, preventing the business cycle and allowing for sustainable economic growth. And then, you know, you uh, explain a little bit about historically, you know, every time this, this power uh, was taken or, you know, this power has been abused every, every single time. So this is why Bitcoin is revolutionary because it can never, ever be abused again. It can never, ever be manipulated or debased, devalued or, you know, um, inflated or whatsoever, like they've done in history through coin clipping, as you, as you mentioned here. Um, but, you know, the, the sort of academic intelligentsia, as you say, you know, providing always excuses for how this is done for the, for the people, you know, to stimulate the economy and blah, blah. So, and then, you know, um, because I want to go to a practical question here, um, because in your last sentence, you say money is the backbone of the market economy. It is what coordinates the action of everyone, which is why it must be neutral, resistant to manipulations and forced debasements. It is time it would take the thing out of the hands of the state back into the hands of the people it's time to move to bitcoin now that's those couple of words back into the hands of the people how would you do that ben 
because it's all about demand, supply and demand and utilization, the usage of Bitcoin as a medium mm -hmm. of exchange, as a, as a transactional uh, medium, as a trade uh, medium, as, you know, as for buying and selling. I mean, I have my own idea, but I want to have your, your, I have my own strategy in my head. How would you do that? If you had like a little, you know, let's say uh, you, you would just draw up a, a strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I heard like a few good ideas. I, I don't exactly remember who, uh, who it was. So there was that guy who talked about, for example, the, um, the intolerant minority board from TLEB, the, 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 um, the term. <laughs> So of creating some intolerant minority of Bitcoiners, which just eventualizes and pushes it. Uh, I think this is a, a pretty a pretty good approach um, or one uh, one possibility. Um, I am actually like I, I see a few options. Like either people are either we try to, to just educate as many people as we can. I'm not sure how realistic that is but uh, this is one approach. Uh, another option is just to, you know, is just to wait for economic, uh, economic issues to, to just arise inevitably and uh, until people see that they just have to use Bitcoin in order to, to prevent their wealth from being confiscated. So it basically, because uh, eventually the, the inflation will have to take place. And when it starts to take place, people will have to start uh, running away from it. Uh, when that happens, I think Bitcoin will really start rising, but we're still uh, somewhat far from it, I think. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really not sure how eventually it will take place, but I do believe it will. Now, my idea, you know, would, would be to, um, because it's a you know it's a parallel universe it's a parallel system we have to uh, gradually build up, and I was thinking mm -hmm. you know uh, since the whole economy is crashing you know there are like what twenty million people alone in the United States unemployed, the the, the economy is melting down. Uh, small businesses, small you know merch, especially the small businesses with a, you know whatever branch they are in, uh, with mm -hmm. the shop owners, merchants, uh, would it be tourism or hospitality or you know just businesses just you know any other businesses they are just um in, you know they're just melting down and and people are losing their jobs or have lost their jobs who knows that if 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 the whole situation you know uh, uh mm -hmm. somehow goes into a normalization back again i mean i you know a lot of experts doubted that uh, doubt that these people are going to ever go back to their to their you know place of work so um would you say it would be it would be wise to you know uh, have sort of a, a special task force you know groups of people uh who who really you know um uh, who have first you know of course the the technical um you know the, the comprehension and the technical knowledge and skills but also you know to uh, sort of as an advisory uh team to these merchants and whether it's you know face to face personal consultation advisory or just you know whether it's possible you know online or through the through some kind of uh, zoom meetings to help them mm -hmm. set up these um the payment system alternative payment system so at least they're prepared once the shit hits the fan then they are you know they have an alternative payment system with their own full node with it, you know, you know, uh, you know, the BTC pay service, mm -hmm. doing, like a great job, you know, they have, they have like, uh, anonymous, like coin mixing coin, uh, you know, for, for full privacy and fungibility, they have all these features and functions, maybe even by default, really easily understandable, super user face, user interface. This is, this is, I think the practical cr crux uh, of this whole uh, thing. Uh, is to how to you know how can we because people are already feeling the pain i mean that's for sure i mean for most people mm -hmm. i think this is totally like a, a totally weird reality that, that most people are in so i think this would be like the perfect time to 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 you know s help these small merchants businesses shop owners set up their their 
you know, payment infrastructure. Uh, mm -hmm. At least they're prepared, you know, once they see, you know, we're going into full whatever from recession to depression to hyperinflation to whatever before that, maybe stagflation, whatever it's called. Uh, but, you know, just let's just call it, you know, what it is, monetary debasement. <laughs> uh, so people, uh, you know, these, these merchants, businesses have a, a ready to go infrastructure to start, you know, doing business, doing trading, you know, in Bitcoin. <laughs> and there we go. You know, it's, it's detached, totally detached from the fiat system. Would that yeah, be a viable strategy? Yeah, I think this is uh, super important. I think this is what happens now. So right, right now, and I absolutely think this is uh, this is viable. Um, I'm not sure if if that will if we will be able to scale that to into mass adoption, whatever that means. But I do think this is like the approach which is right now exists of creating a completely parallel system. I think it is great and. I think it is uh, right now, up to now, I think it's working great. Um, and they think, yes, I, I think it's it's really good uh, to, to continue with that. Um, I think BTC Pay Server and uh, many others are doing an amazing job. I think it, it is already proven, at least uh, partially, that starting to accept to accept Bitcoin is, is a very wise uh, investment, is a very wise uh, move. I think starting to work with, with Bitcoin is all, is also uh, qu quite proven itself in some places at least. Uh, for example, Cash App, which has most of its revenues from Bitcoin already. Um, so yeah, I think this is I think this is a very important approach. I think it is very important to educate many people and to show them why it's so so much better and so important to, to use Bitcoin. And of course, to prepare all the infrastructure needed to, for that, and make it as easy as possible. Um, yes. And I'm really excited for Strike. I, mean, I already contacted, you know, the the developers, and um, unfortunately, it's not ready for Europe yet, for European Union. But they're working on it. And uh, once it comes out, uh, but they are, you know, they have it already for Android, uh, at least, you know, for the States. So once this, uh, was, once this technology or this application uh, is ready to go, um, I have really high hopes because that would mean customers don't even need to think about paying in Bitcoin. They just pay. They just pay and the merchant can choose whether, you know, it's going to be automatically uh instantaneously converted or paid in fiat or in bitcoin i mean that would be awesome because the customer the you know don't even need to to you know to to even even the bitcoin haters you know <laughs> they would just pay uh, with their you know they would get like five to ten percent discount you know you tell them hey you know what you get five to ten percent discount here's the app just pay and 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 it's all you know it's all by default it's all by it's all automatic and i think mm -hmm. this is what we need to work on the use interface use experience it needs to be easy it needs to be easy understandable because i talk to people i know merchants who would do this right away but uh i think it's not fully implementable the way i you know envisit envision it you know, with the whole mm -hmm. coin join, you could even have a samurai wallet where you pay sort of directly from your wallet uh, because it's already been coin joined or a coin mix or whatever. Or what is this other uh, feature that's now come out? Uh, pay join? A pay to endpoint or what is it? P pay P to endpoint is, yeah, it's the same thing. It's yeah, sort of, basically. you know, to increase the fungibility and privacy uh, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, aspects. And that would be awesome because then you you know then this would tr truly mean a totally decentralized and detached fiat detached um, um, rational economy based on bitcoin that's all what we need yeah i think that's the, i think this is a really exciting product I, I i don't think i will be able to use it in the in the, in the next few years but they hope eventually it will also get here mm -hmm. um but yeah i think it's really awesome and really important and this is you know what i would love to do i mean i would really love to do a tour 
uh, I mean, Austria, you know, go through all these. I mean, I mean, I, I know people in Vienna. I know people in Graz, you know, another city and they're mm -hmm. willing. People are now, this is like the most mature time I've ever seen. People are now feeling, they don't know what's coming. They're insecure. They're fearful because fear is the tool, you know, how you manipulate people, but we can turn mm -hmm. it upside down. We can put, you know, convert this fear uh, and open, open it up, you know, for comprehension so that people understand what you're writing about. What's, what's the, at the end of the day, what's the essence of your article? <laughs> you know, it's about mm -hmm. like creating prosperity, economic prosperity for, pe for people, you know, whether it be merchants, customers, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, employees, workers, um, savers, you know, finally people can start mm -hmm. saving and, 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 uh, you know, that one single Satoshi is going to buy more in one year. That's all what people need to know. It's about the power of the, per the power, the purchasing power of Bitcoin. This will exponentially rise once this thing, you know, makes, makes a aha moment, you know, in the brains of the people, they will understand also the absolute scarcity of Bitcoin, you know, because mm -hmm. I think we got to break down sometimes the language and. I've been really thinking in the last few days, how can we like, you know, because otherwise, you know, we're just going to be an echo chamber. Uh, we are, I mean, you know, we are in this Bitcoin space in Austin economics, we're in, you know, on Twitter, but we're not, I have the feeling we, we have to really go outside and, 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 you know, and, and, um, and make the best out of this opportunity. You know, maybe that's the best thing it, it has ever happened to us, you know, as a society with all this Corona, you know, uh, fear mongering and, and, you know, I mean, to be taken seriously, mm -hmm. but, but it's over, uh, totally out of proportion, the, you know, the, the Corona measures and, you know, I mean, it's totally insane what, you know, what's going on. What, what's your take, uh, Stephanie, on this whole uh, process? Yeah, so I definitely see that more and more people are waking up and questioning the current system and also the current financial system and thereby they're becoming more open to Bitcoin. I also see so many um, like videos online that are actually questioning the financial system and saying, yeah, money is created out of, out of thin air and the people are starting to really notice now and it's changed. So they know that the system is not good for them and so they're looking for an alternative. And, you know, when I'm teaching my students why Bitcoin is relevant, I first explain them how the financial system works and then they kind of automatically understand why Bitcoin is relevant. And I think we're going to this like very fast, actually, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because, guys, I mean, you know, I mean, just just, you know, if you look at the reality right now, I think people are not, I think, are not really conscious or aware how serious the situation is. I mean, it's much more at stake, you know, uh, when we, we are, we're talking about our freedom. It, we, I mean, look at the censorship right now that's going on. Look at the, you know, encroaching like on, on civil liberties and the surveillance and, and vaccination programs with Bill Gates and Fauci and they're all, you know, front organization uh, of, of the pharmaceutical and the WHO and the CDC and the, whatever Chinese Communist Party, you know, it, it's really insane if you think about it. So uh, the question I'm, I'm asking is always, do we really have that much time? Because I always hear, oh, you know, it's, this is like a gradual thing. It needs time, like 10, 20, 30 years. Seriously, I don't know where we're going to be in 30 years. Do we really want to repeat like, a, but on a high tech, techn technocra technocratic level, uh, you know, the 30s or whatever, you know, uh, dictatorial tyr tyranny like um, the conditions? People just because people don't understand because because people can't even imagine this could happen again in a much more you know worse uh, form. Uh, it's um, I don't know what to say. You know um, we need to you know tackle this, solve this problem at the root of you know of this whole thing, and that's money. You know mm -hmm. um, the faster you know people understand this, the, the you know the the faster we can you know. Uh, roll this out and uh, and and really trigger the critical mass adoption with it be five or ten percent of the yeah. earth's population so unfortunately i see quite some people calling for a gold standard and we had this already during Bretton woods and um, during this time the federal reserve had actually all the gold and um, one ounce of gold was worth 35 us dollar everyone agreed on that and then the exchange rates worldwide were packed to the us dollar so you actually had this one central custody provider 
and the Federal Reserve then lost trust because they were creating more US dollar than um, they actually had the gold. So um, Rothbard calls this fake, uh, no, pseudo warehouse receipts. It's just creation of money out of thin air. And um, we know that central banks were buying more gold now. So um, it is possible that this card will be played. But I hope more people realize that, you know, they would just do the same. So it's, it doesn't help anything. So we need to get rid of these central custody providers. And here I also want to lay out, this is also a threat to Bitcoin. It's a little bit different and I would like to go into this a little bit. So um, when you're placing your Bitcoin at a custody provider, you first have to make sure that you really have an address so you can check whether your Bitcoin are still lying there. If you don't have that, um, the custody provider can just give the, the Bitcoins out to someone else and saying, yeah, you still have them, although you don't have them. And it's only like uncovered as soon as there's a bailout and everyone tries to get the Bitcoin and then you realize that they were already um, already distributed. So this is what happened during gold. This is the fake warehouse or the pseudo warehouse receipt. This could potentially happen with Bitcoin. So um, we need to make sure that the people are checking their addresses and that you really have a Bitcoin address that you can check on the block explorer. So this is really magnificent and this is different to gold. And this is why um, the custody service is also superior of uh, a gold custody in case you have these separate addresses. And of course, you also have to make sure that you have a trustworthy custody provider. But yeah, you are again giving out trust to a central authority then. So um, this custody solution must be taken with great care. And you also need to check who's the management, yeah, who's auditing this whole thing. Uh, Daniel Wingen and I, we were writing a longer article on that in the crypto research report. So yeah, um, this is really something that we also have to look at. So, and we shall not go into the same problem of, again, where custody providers create pseudo warehouse receipts and just create money out of thin air and just do it by mere fraud. So Rothbard actually was saying that when you have proper laws, when you have proper audits, this could not happen. And this is what the Austrian economists mean. Then you have a competition between those custody providers and those that are acting dishonest are uncovered and they will not, cannot operate again. And this is the, the way of arguing how, how it should not happen. But since the government is backing the system of fraud, actually, it happened. So we have to be aware of that. Yeah. This is why, you know, it's so, Bitcoin is so transformational. This has never been done in history. This is why, you know, uh, the, the Bitcoiners are cryptographers. They say, do not trust, verify. So finally, we have a system, we have mathematics, we have cryptography, because the tendency is always towards centralization. And for the first time in, in human history, we can, we can undo this. We can, like, really make sure everybody can audit it. At ev on like in every moment, you can see exactly what's going on, right? What block and whatever, what time, you know, it's being, uh, how much, you know, what Bitcoin is produced. I mean, you, you have like total audibility. Um, and is yeah, and this is, uh, this is, I think, you know, totally a total game changer, a total game changer, you know? So, yeah, so, um, yeah, let's just wrap it up. Uh, do you guys have any final thoughts or uh, messages to my listeners, um, viewers? Well, yeah, one message actually is um, learn how uh, the private public key pair works and get your own wallet, be, be your own bank. Um, hold your bitcoins in self custody. I mean, if you have a lot of Bitcoin, I understand that you want to like diversify the risk and put some at a custody provider. If you do so, really check it in great depth how they secure it, how they do a backup, and uh, make sure that the bitcoins that you decide to put in custody are stored on a specific address that you can verify. Or, uh, uh, multi-signature right i mean would that would be like preferably maybe you know like a multi-signature is that what you 
also uh, alluding no, to? What, meaning, what I mean is, um, I mean, a custody provider can have a book where they say who owns how many Bitcoins and they have mm -hmm. all Bitcoins bundled on one address. Okay. This is not a good idea. So every, um, every customer should have their own address where they can verify that the Bitcoins are still at place that are not lent out with these pseudo warehouse receipts. This is really important. Mm -hmm. Multi signature is important to have more, uh, more, more, more safety, more security, so that you have the keys like in three different geographic locations, and then you need um, two out of three, for example, and you go to two locations, and then you can make the transaction. And here you need also the the security uh, that not everyone can come in in a way. And if you just have um, uh, one out of one uh, multi single sick, how you say, like the normal way of, uh, of transferring Bitcoin, then it's much more easily hackable or stealable. And this is why this multi-signature signature, signature scheme is um, just more security and more safety. That, um, yeah. But there are like many things. So you, I also recommend to go in depth into this custody thing. And as I said, um, crypto research, there's uh, this article on custody. I, we published this in, in January, I think. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ben, what's your final uh, message <laughs> to, to my listeners? Yeah, sure. So, yeah, I, I agree with Stefan. Run your full node, uh, hold your keys. Um, I actually have like for full nodes, I have a list in my previous article called Bending Bitcoin. I have in the last uh, few while, uh, uh, last section, there is a list of how to run a full node with a lot of resources um but yeah i don't think this is all of this is very important uh, yeah great well then thank you so much uh, both of you thanks so much for sharing your knowledge and for your time hope to you know repeat this maybe once in a while um you know maybe with other uh, bitcoiners together you know with the, with the three of us and yeah and yeah thanks for inviting was my All pleasure. Right. <laughs> talk to you soon. Bye bye. All right. All right. So that was my talk, uh, my panel discussion with Stephanie von Jan and Ben Kaufmann. Really uh, bright, uh, brilliant minds and brains, um, uh, each in their own fields of expertise and knowledge. Uh, you know, they're all economists, and you know, really understand the principle, fundamental principles. You know, full comprehension of 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 you know what is Bitcoin, where we are, where are we, where we go. So, my final message really would be: if you know any small businesses, merchants, um, you know, shop owners, anybody who's doing any kind of business, please tell them. You know, educate yourself, get yourself a full note, get yourself help. If you if you can't do it on your own. There's so many, you know, uh, bright people out there who are doing like open source work for free. You know, uh, you could even, you know, support them by donating something. These are all really super ethical and, and visionary people who are doing it for the cause, all right? For, for, for the sake of freedom, for of humanity, for, you know, uh, creating a more prosperous, joyful life for all of us. So, uh, yeah, it's about freedom. You know, at the end of the day, Bitcoin is about freedom. So tell them, you know, set up a full node with BTC pay server, uh, download and install, you know, uh, one or two or three Bitcoin wallets, hard, you know, a, a Bitcoin, a Bitcoin wallet, a Lightning wallet. You've got the Samurai wallet where you already, you know, you can coin join in the mobile already, um, not only the desktop. And, uh, you know, so you have, so people, the merchants, small businesses and shop owners uh, and, you know, anybody, you know, who's doing some kind of trading or business you know, has already a parallel system for alternative payment, you know, uh, option that is Bitcoin, the hardest and scarcest money ever created in human history, totally decentralized, immutable, um, uh, fungible, divisible, um, unconfiscatable, you know. They can't stop it, all right. And and once you know the these criminal actions of the nation states, governments, and central banks, you know, reach a certain degree, people are already set in. You know, they're already set. You know, for the for for a new evolution, they're already prepared. Preparation is everything. And then you know you and then once strike comes out uh, for Europe and other continents, 
uh, you know, merchants can just choose, you know, the customers don't even think, you know, what, what kind of currency they're paying, <laughs> you know, it just, it just, uh, because it's on a, on a second layer, it's peer to peer and, um, and, you know, and the merchant can decide if instantaneous, like, do, do I want to like be paid in Bitcoin or fiat, you know, like convert it. Uh, instantaneously. So these are all the features and functions and applications. I want, um, you know, I want to go deeper you know, with other uh, specialist developers and and UX UI uh, uh, um, uh, experts, and really create create a new ecosystem. You know, new clusters of uh, of of, econ of Bitcoin economies everywhere around this planet. This is how we create freedom. All right, we it's called monetary root layering. You know. And so that, you know, this sickening, you know, uh, a totally unethical, criminal, untouchable structures become obsolete, whether it be nation states, governments, especially, and especially the central banks. Well, thank you so much for listening and for your support and hope to create a new evolutionary civilization with all of us together. All right. The Total Connector checks out. Bye. Mm -hmm.